Howdy y'all. One of the most common practices in film is taking pre-existing novels and adapting them into movies. This has created some of the greatest movies of all time, but often, in the process of adapting a film, the meaning of the source material can be lost. And even if the movie is largely faithful to the book, the movie can still wind up not translating well. I believe there's no better example of this than the two film adaptations of Vladimir Nabokov's 1955 novel, Lolita. The infamous story has a unique position in the world of adaptations, having received a not particularly faithful adaptation, as well as a far more faithful adaptation, but with both failing to capture much of what we find in the original text. So today, I'd like to go over how these movies failed, as well as looking at why Lolita in particular is such a difficult, if not impossible, story to fully bring to film. Also, heads up, this video is going to get into some pretty heavy topics. And by the end, you'll probably hate Stanley Kubrick. Assuming you don't already. Part 1. The only good version of Lolita. Before we get into the films, let's briefly cover the plot of the novel. Lolita begins with a foreword from a fictional psychiatrist, explaining that the novel is a manuscript written by a Mr. Humbert Humbert while in captivity awaiting trial, that he died before his trial, and that the girl he's writing about also died shortly after of pregnancy complications. The psychiatrist says that Humbert is evil, and that the novel will become a classic psychiatric case study, and the novel begins, opening with one of the most iconic monologues in literature. Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, Lolita. The monologue introduces us to the titular character, although the title isn't her actual name. She was Dolores on the dotted line, but in my arms, she was always Lolita. Humbert also establishes his first sexual attachment with a young girl, although this one occurring when he was also a child. There might have been no Lolita at all had I not loved one summer a certain initial girl child. He then reveals that he's a murderer and a writer. You can always count on a murderer for fancy prose style. Two equally bad things there. Finally, he frames the audience as a jury and invites them to examine the story. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, look at this tangle of thorns. I promise I won't go line by line like this for the whole book. I just really like this opening. So when considering this book, there's a couple things that are important to keep in mind. Firstly, Humbert Humbert is a bad person. He's a self-confessed murderer. The psychiatrist reviewing his manuscript spent an entire paragraph saying he's evil a bunch of times, and we're going to read more about his crimes as we go on. Secondly, the entire story is told by Humbert, who is explicitly framing it as an appeal to a jury, and combining that with his mental state, he makes several references to visiting menstrual institutions and only gets worse as the novel goes on. It stands to reason his account may not be entirely reliable. So everything he says should be taken with a couple hundred grains of salt. With those ground rules set, here's finally the actual plot. Humbert Humbert is born in 1910 in France. He describes his parentage and schooling, being a fairly wealthy private school kid. At 13, he met Annabelle, a girl a few months younger than him, who had recently moved in nearby. The two fell for each other, and Humbert laments how under the watchful eye of adults, they were unable to engage in anything beyond sneaking handholds. At one point, growing desperate, they sneak off and almost do it. But once again, they are thwarted, and soon after, Annabelle was dead of typhus. Humbert grows up, becomes a writer, but is left affected by the incident. Believing that his obsession with Annabelle, combined with the shock of her untimely passing, contributed to his obsession with what he calls nymphettes. Seems more like an excuse than a reason, but whatever. He spends pages upon pages defining the term nymphette, and going over what does and doesn't count as a nymphette. But basically, it's a prepubescent girl around the ages of 9 to 14 that he's attracted to. He talks about 
demonic nature, and how looks don't matter for qualification. And if he wants to think that, okay, I guess, but come on now. After delivering his Nymphet lecture, Humbert recounts his first marriage. Wanting to avoid any suspicion of his sexual interest, he pursues a wife, settling upon a woman in her late twenties named Valeria, who he could only stomach because she acted somewhat like a little girl. Although the two rarely do anything, due to her, you know, being an adult. Eventually, she finds someone else, and they are divorced. Humbert moves to New York and spends a few years working on an academic text, an Arctic expedition, and a stay in a mental facility. Humbert then decides that he's had enough of the city, and decides to spend the summer at the house of an acquaintance in New England, enticed by the prospect of living with their 12-year-old daughter, who he wishes to coach in French and fondle in Humbertish. This plan is ruined, however, as their house burns down just before he arrives in town. Fortunately, he is offered a backup plan, staying at the house of a Mrs. Charlotte Hayes. He is brought to the house, introduced to Miss Hayes, a widow in her 30s, who he is, shockingly, not all that attracted to, and Lois, the Hayes' black housekeeper, who doesn't play much into the story, but is also the only black person who speaks in the entire book so it would feel weird not to give her a mention. Yeah, you can tell this was written in the 50s. Nonetheless, Humbert is not particularly impressed by the house, until he steps out to the garden and sees her, Dolores Hayes. And, uh, Nabokov puts it in really pretty language, but the gist is that he's like, super turned on, and resolves to stay at the house. So he moves in, and starts keeping a journal of his interactions with Dolores, or as he calls her, Lolita. I'm gonna mostly stick to calling her Dolores or Lo, since much modern discussion around the book is focused on separating Dolores, the person, and Lolita, Humbert's obsessive view of her. We'll talk about this more when we get to the Kubrick film. See, that's what we in the literary world call foreshadowing. He grows increasingly obsessed with Lo. God, what I would not have given to kiss those delicate boned, long toed, monkeyish feet, and becomes more and more of a confidant for Charlotte, who makes no secret of her growing impatience with Lo, who she sees as a bratty, ungrateful child. Humbert only wishes to have Charlotte put out of the picture. I long for some terrific disaster. Her mother is messily, but instantly and permanently removed. Lolita whimpers in my arms. I enjoy her among the ruins. I'm gonna skip over most of them for your sake, but this stay in Ramsdale consists largely of leering at Dolores, finding any pretense to touch her, such as insisting on massaging a bruise on her thigh, all the while staying just shy of anything that would ruin his reputation. This culminates in the lap scene, where Lo stretches her legs across Humbert's lap as the two lays on the sofa, and Humbert uses the opportunity to achieve release. Later, when Dolores is at a friend's, Charlotte tells Humbert that she will be going to summer camp until school begins. Humbert is devastated. No children to creep on? How will he survive? Soon, Lo is heading off for camp. Before she leaves, she gives Humbert a kiss goodbye. Her innocent mouth melting under the pressure of dark male jaws. Thank you, Humbert. And she's off. Before Humbert can bemoan his misery, Lois presents him a letter from Charlotte. The letter is a love confession, telling him to leave at once, for if he stays, it means he loves her back. While initially repulsed by the prospect of marriage to a woman over 13, he realizes it could be a good way to get closer to Lo. So when Charlotte returns, Humbert is there. The two are soon married, and their marriage goes about as well as you'd expect. Charlotte is smitten and constantly trying to do activities, focus on being a housewife, and much to Humbert's dismay, talking to him. But he's able to stomach domestic life for a while, safe in the knowledge that Dolores will soon be returned from camp until one day when Charlotte is discussing how she wants a full live-in maid for the house. 
because screw Lois, I guess. Humbert questions where the maid would sleep. Charlotte tells him the maid will get Lowe's room, as she's already made plans to send her daughter to boarding school after camp is over. Dismayed at the thought of losing access to the child, Humbert starts planning to murder Charlotte. He plans to drown her while the two are at the lake, an easy enough death to pass off as an accident. Well, what do you know, folks? I just could not make myself do it. Humbert considers himself too passive to commit murder. He then goes on a sickly funny rant about how people like him just want to pursue their hot, wet, private acts of sexual deviation without the police and society cracking down upon them. So really, Humbert is not a monster. He's just a libertarian. Rather than killing Charlotte, Humbert sets his sights on his backup plan, sleeping pills. He's been experimenting on Charlotte with drugs that would knock both her and Lo out for long enough that he could, you know. But so far, all the drugs have proven insufficient. The doctor finally gives him the strongest pills he has. Humbert is rejoiced, but upon arriving home, he finds Charlotte in a rage. She's found the notebook, the notebook full of lust for her daughter and hatred of her. She's righteously furious at him and is setting about writing letters to tell everyone of his true nature. Humbert, meanwhile, is setting about gaslighting. You are crazy, Charlotte. The notes you found were merely fragments of a novel. He prepares a drink to try to calm her down, but then receives a call. Charlotte is dead, having apparently rushed outside and been hit by a car. Whether or not Charlotte's death was an accident is another bit of the book that gets debated a lot. We know Humbert is a liar, had already plotted her murder, and had everything riding on her not getting those letters out. Personally, I think it's way too convenient she just happened to die right when he needed. But feel free to debate in the comments. It's good for engagement. Fact of the matter is though, Charlotte is dead, and now Humbert has sole custody of Dolores. He decides to pick her up from camp and take her to a hotel under the pretense that her mother is merely ill. Upon leaving the camp, she chides him for not kissing her. So he does, inwardly rejoicing, while recognizing that, for her, this is just playful teasing. I knew, of course, it was but an innocent game on her part. I was dreadfully afraid I might go too far and cause her to start back in revulsion and terror. Eventually, the two reach the hotel. Unfortunately, they only have rooms with single beds. Humbert says he'll find a cot, but Lo is nonetheless mortified. After the two have dinner, Humbert gives her one of the sleeping pills, passing it off as a vitamin, and heads down to the lobby. Humbert makes the case of how his impending crime is not so severe. Gentle women of the jury. Reaffirming his commitment to limit his actions to while Lo is under the influence of sleeping drugs, in the interest of sparing her purity, all the while claiming that such purity was thoroughly debunked by modern science, and had already been stripped by some juvenile erotic experience, no doubt homosexual, at that accursed camp of hers. He's interrupted in his reasoning by a man striking up conversation. It seems to Humbert like the man is onto his actions so he sits there uncomfortably until he can safely retreat back to his room. Humbert enters the room to a prone Dolores. He's ready, but when he reaches the bed, she stirs. The sleeping pills were, as he'd later learn, mostly just placebos. Left with no recourse, he resolves to wait and stuff her with the other pills the next day. The next bit is gonna get bad, so I'm gonna share a funny line I couldn't find another way to work in. Please, reader, no matter your exasperation with the tender-hearted, morbidly sensitive, infinitely circumspect hero of my book, do not skip these essential pages. I just love Humbert's mental image of himself. Like, what a wacky dude. Anyways, the next morning, Humbert and Lo have sex. And it's here in the book where I get mad at a shockingly high portion of the reading public. Because Lo is often portrayed as a malevolent temptress seducing Humbert. Our only source to support that 
is Humber. Frigid gentlewomen of the jury, it was she who seduced me, who is a pedophile who is lusting over her from first sight. He goes on to claim Lowe initiated the interaction as a game she and the boy from camp had played. My introduction to this novel was from a dude saying, like, yeah, man, it's wild. Like, you really can't tell, like, who's abusing who. As we continue on in the story, I trust it will be very clear to y'all who's abusing who. But even if we are to believe Humbert, we shouldn't, and accept that this relationship is 100% initiated by Lowe, it's not. It's important to understand that this still isn't acceptable. She's 12, and he's her stepdad and sole caretaker. None of his excuses. Sensitive gentlewomen of the jury, I was not even her first lover. Render his actions acceptable. And it's a disgrace how many readers throughout history have missed out on that basic fact. Anyways, the two get on the road while Lo recounts her previous sexual interactions with peers her own age, the boy from camp, and one of her girlfriends. Yes, queen, we stand a bisexual icon. I hate myself. <laughs> As they drive, Lo asks if they can stop at a gas station, complaining of pains and telling Humbert, seemingly jokingly, I was a daisy fresh girl and look what you've done to me. I ought to call the police and tell them you raped me, you dirty, dirty old man. I say seemingly jokingly, as Humbert notes, An ominous hysterical note rained through her silly words. As they're leaving the station, Lo asks for some change to call her mother. Humbert refuses this request, with Lo growing increasingly irritated. Why can't I call my mother if I want to? Because your mother is dead. They stop at a new hotel in a new town. At the hotel, we had separate rooms, but she came into mine in the middle of the night, and we made up very gently. You see, she had absolutely nowhere else to go. Lolita is often wrongly considered a love story, but as others have noted, from Dolores' perspective, it can really only be classified as horror. So the two embark on a cross-country road trip, staying in hotels so Humbert can delight in his unfettered nymphette access. He keeps her obedient with gifts and treats, not only to ensure she'll comply with his desires, but also to keep secret what is happening, lording above her the threat that if he goes to jail, she's an orphan. So the two continue driving, not having any real destination. They go to movies, visit attractions, and have Lo take up tennis lessons in an effort to keep her spirits up, and thus, Humbert's secrets safe. All the while, Lo is growing discontented with the lifestyle. She asked, how long did I think we were going to be living in stuffy cabins, doing filthy things together, and never behaving like ordinary people? While Humbert is simultaneously growing increasingly paranoid every time Lo is out of his sight or with a boy. After about half a year, he decides they're best off settling permanently in the town of Beardsley, where Lo could be enrolled in school, and Humbert could use the local Beardsley College, both as a source of income and to find out what exactly his legal situation with Lo's custody is. Shockingly, in his rush to bone her, he didn't research custody law. He reflects upon how, despite all their travel, the trip had really just been characterized by his crimes and her sobs in the night, every night, the moment I feign sleep. They move into a house near the school, so Humbert can spy on the schoolgirls. Adapting to the sedentary life, Humbert institutes an allowance for Lo, given to her under the condition she fulfill her basic obligations. Yes, he means what you think he means there. Humbert recounts how he often stumbled upon stashes of money Lo had hidden away, likely in the hopes of escaping him. He steals the money. This is not the only way in which Lo appears to be fighting her situation. While Humbert heavily restricts her relations with boys, allowing them only at the house where he can monitor them, girls are welcome, 
and especially encouraged to come over. Though, he notes that whenever he identifies one as a nymphette, Lo stops bringing them over. It's honestly a testament to Dolores that she's so unwilling to let any other girl suffer as she has. One day, Humbert is called into school to discuss Lo's behavior. The school is run by a bunch of Freudians, who are concerned Dolores isn't sexually developing properly. They insist he allow Lo to participate in the school play and take piano lessons to aid her development. He relents after realizing it may be necessary to avoid suspicion, and after procuring certain services from Lo in exchange. So Lo goes about rehearsals, and Humbert goes about his self-inflicted paranoia meltdown, which eventually bubbles over when he learns Lo has been skipping her piano lessons. He confronts her in a rage, believing his secret is out. But like him, she has also had enough. She said she was sure I had murdered her mother. When a neighbor calls about the screaming, Lo escapes. After a while of looking, Humbert eventually finds her making a call at a phone booth. She tells him she was just trying to call home, and has a remarkably happier attitude, telling Humbert she wants to leave Beardsley and go on the road again. He agrees to the trip, and they head home where Humbert assures any physiologist reading that, uh, his equipment still works. So the two embark on another cross-country road trip. Low spirits seemingly very high, although this does nothing to quell Humbert's suspicions. He freaks out whenever she's gone out without him. Whenever she talks to someone else, suspects she's making plans to escape with every boy around. And this grows all the worse when he notices a red car has started following them on the road. This continues for the duration of their trip, which I'm skipping over mostly because honestly, the second half of the book is pretty meandering. Nabokov is a Russian author after all. It's longer than it has to be. <laughs> Anyways, after a whole host of travel, including a five page aside about how Lowe plays tennis that I think was enjoyed by me and nobody else. Humbert arrives at the cabin they're staying in, and finds that Dolores has fallen ill. Giving up all hope of intercourse, he takes her to the hospital, where she is to stay for a few days until she is well. Upon returning to the cabin, Humbert reflects on how bad he feels to be separated from Lo, a feeling he will have to get used to, as on one of his many trips to visit her, he arrives to find someone has already checked her out. She's escaped. Humbert tries to track her down, knowing the man she escaped with was almost certainly the driver of the red car. But while he can follow the trail, he can never find the man. Eventually, he ceases the search, enters a relationship with a woman named Rita in her late 20s, who looks prepubescent enough. Until one day, three years after her escape, he receives a letter from Dolores. She's married, pregnant, and in debt. With nowhere left to go, she's turned to Humbert to send some money. Humbert, rejoiced at the prospect of reunification with his nymphette, abandons Rita, grabs a gun, tracks down Lowe's house, and knocks. She's taller, pregnant, smoking, wearing glasses, and surprisingly kind given her letter told him not to find their house. She invites Humbert in and points to Dick, her husband, in the yard. Humbert, Realizing Dick is not the man he's looking for, presses Dolores to tell him who it was she had escaped with. She resists, clearly wanting to put the past behind her, but eventually relents as Humbert threatens to leave. The man who helped her escape was the only man she had ever been crazy about, Claire Quilty. Okay, so who the fuck is Claire Quilty? Well, I couldn't really work it into a plot summary easily but he's been hinted at throughout the entire novel. His uncle was a neighbor of theirs at the Hayes house. Lowe had a poster of him in her room. He was the man who Humbert had spoken to at the hotel. He was a playwright and had written the play Lowe was rehearsing at school. He was at her tennis lessons. There's more passing references to him than I can keep track of, honestly. It makes rereads of the book pretty interesting, because you notice all the hints of him that could have initially been brushed off. But yeah, he was the one who took her out of the hospital and into its care, promising he'd help her land acting roles. 
In reality, she was taken to his ranch and asked to be in smut films. She told Quilty she wasn't going to, because she only liked him, and he kicked her out. Hearing this, Hopper makes a request, begging her to leave Dick and come with him. She says she'd sooner go back to Quilty than go with him. Good for her, honestly. He gives her $4,000 and leaves crying. Humbert drives. He's heading back to Ramsdale. He doesn't need to rush because he knows Quilty is already as good as dead. He thinks over his relationship with Lo, full of regret and post hoc self-flagellation. I loved you. I was a pentapod monster, but I loved you. I was despicable and brutal, and there were times when I knew how you felt and it was hell to know it, my little one, Lolita. It should be noted just how readily Humber admits he was in the wrong at many points in the novel. It makes it even stranger how so many interpret him as not in the wrong, or even as a victim. But I digress. He visits the old Hayes house, is accosted by the old neighbors, he heads to Quilty. Arriving at his house, Humber is surprised to find it unlocked. A rather funny murder scene ensues, in which Quilty initially doesn't notice Humber in the house. Then, when he does, he thinks he's some debt collector. Humbert tells him he's going to die, and Quilty doesn't seem to really understand the gravity of the situation. They wrestle for a little, but Humbert wins, and while he checks to make sure the sweat didn't damage the gun, he has Quilty read a poem he wrote, telling him why he's killing him. Afterward, Quilty suggests they postpone the murder till a later date, when both men are more fit for the task. Humbert finally kills him, and then goes downstairs, where Quilty's house guests offer him a drink and then congratulate him on the murder. Humbert leaves and is soon captured. He ends his memoir with a request that it not be published until both he and Dolores are dead, which, as we learned in the beginning, will take all of a few months, and delivers a final message to her. I'm thinking of aurochs and angels, and this is the only immortality you and I may share. My. Lolita. So yeah, that was Lolita. As you can see, it's a complicated story, a long story, as well as one with incredibly heavy and off-putting themes. The kind of story that would be incredibly difficult to adapt into a film. This was so widely recognized, in fact, that the tagline of the first movie is literally, how did they ever make a movie of Lolita? But Maybe, just maybe, with a talented cast and someone who's widely regarded as one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, it can be done. So let's take a look at Stanley Kubrick's Lolita. Just gonna pop it in and I'll see y'all when it's over. Two and a half hours later. What the fuck? How did they make every wrong decision? Did they even read the book? Why would they make this? Part 2. Why you shouldn't trust Stanley Kubrick with your novel. Lolita the novel was a very big hit once it finally got published, and around this time a young Stanley Kubrick was just coming off of his film Spartacus and looking for his next project. He was interested in doing an adaptation of Lolita and secured the rights to do so for $150,000, about $1.5 million in today's money. But while he was able to get the rights to adapt the story relatively easily, he wanted Nabokov himself to write the screenplay. I want to mention here that I'm getting a lot of my info surrounding the production of the Kubrick film from Jamie Loftus' incredible Lolita podcast. If you want to know more about the book and its cultural impact, I would highly recommend it link in the doobly-doo. Yeah, so Nabokov didn't really want to write the screenplay. He really didn't like the idea of messing with his own story like that, but was eventually convinced with the help of some more money. So he moved out to Hollywood and started working on the screenplay, and eventually he turned in a 400-page screenplay, which would have resulted in the movie with about a 7-hour runtime. And while well, personally, I think that's fucking hilarious. Kubrick and James B. Harris, the film's producer, did not find it as endearing. Reluctantly, Nabokov made an extremely cut-down 200-page screenplay, 
which you can actually read if you want to. And you can only read it, because this is not the script Kubrick and Harris would make, opting to give up on Nabokov and write their own. So when you see Nabokov's name in the credits, that's purely contractual obligation. This is Kubrick and Harris's script through and through, but they faced some serious setbacks in creating a screenplay that they could make into a movie. I didn't really get into it, but publishing Lolita was a serious endeavor. No publishing house wanted to touch it. Nabokov eventually had to resort to Olympia Press, a small publishing house that primarily put out smut novels. Now, if publishing Lolita in 1955 was a struggle, making a completely faithful film adaptation in 1962 would be near impossible. Because at this time, Hollywood was still subject to the draconian Hayes production code. This code prohibited anything that was antithetical to the Catholic faith, like queer people or interracial romance. Digs at Catholicism aside, this was a serious problem in adapting Lolita. The code bans sexual persuasions and rape, which, in case you hadn't noticed, is pretty central to the novel. The homosexuality ban means that Lo is no longer allowed to be a bisexual icon. We do not stand. The prohibitions on nudity and scenes of passion mean we're not going to see any of the sexual interactions, which, you know, is definitely for the best. There's a reason the novel doesn't go into much detail for these scenes either. It's fucking gross. But because of the code, you can't even suggest that that's what's happening. They're trying to adapt a story while they can't even mention the central conceit of the story. And Kubrick will go on to use this as an excuse for the shortcomings of the film. But I think it's an oversight to pin everything on the production code. As we'll see, while the movie was set back from the start, Kubrick made choice after choice that just further ruined it. In fact, I think the movie would have been bad even if Kubrick had full creative control, free from any censorship. Why? Because I believe he fundamentally does not understand the novel. You see, Kubrick shares the strangely popular opinion, most notably penned by famous literary critic Lionel Trilly, that Lolita is the first great love story of the 20th century. What could lead one to examine this book and come away with the conclusion that it's a love story? Well, since Kubrick agrees with Trilling, let's look at Trilling's review of the novel. He employs a technique used extensively by Humbert himself, pointing towards historical precedent for such a relationship, with previous literary couples such as Juliet and Paris, or Dante and Beatrice, where an adult man pursues a young girl, in Dante's case, only eight years old. You know, maybe he should have stayed in the inferno. Humbert does something similar throughout the novel, bringing up notable historical figures who were into little girls. It's a very, this is how it's always been done, sort of justification. Trilling also compares the relationship to French courtly love, where married people would flirt with other married people establishing a relationship that society would never permit them to consummate. Further, Trilly points to the sheer obsession and devotion that Humbert seems to display for his Lolita. I suppose we are naturally inclined to be lenient towards a rapist, who eventually feels a deathless devotion to his victim. I don't think that a continued obsession with his victim makes Humbert a more forgivable character. But this isn't an unpopular interpretation. I think this is a risk you run by framing the entire novel through Humbert's point of view. Just look at every other villain protagonist story. Well, personally, I was inclined to empathize with Dolores. Had I first read this book as a 50-year-old man in 1955, instead of as an 18-year-old during the Me Too movement, my interpretation likely would have differed. I'm not saying this to dunk on a long-dead literary critic, by the way. I think his reading is a lacking one, but it's clear why he sees it the way he does, and he acknowledges that this love is at best mostly one-sided. When describing their reunion once Dolores is pregnant, Trilling says, He begs her to return to him. She refuses. It is to her a surprising idea that he loves her, or had ever loved her. 
She is as unrecognizing of his feeling for her as if she were indeed his daughter. Not helping the matter is that Dolores isn't necessarily the model of a perfect victim. As Trilling says, Perhaps Humbert's depravity is easier to accept when we learn that he deals with a Lolita who is not so innocent. By no means do I wish to diminish her suffering, but from the information we are presented, she initiates the relationship. And while I'd consider this dubious at best, considering the entire novel is told by a pedophile liar, Lowe's seeming consent is likely the single biggest factor in how many interpreted the story. From my interpretation, I'd say at most, Lowe is a willing participant in only the first encounter. I'm still not completely sold on this, and to be clear, this does not excuse Humbert, he's a rapist. For every encounter following that, her participation seems to me driven by circumstances. She had absolutely nowhere else to go. Money, acquired in the interest of escaping, or deceiving Humbert. When the two leave Beardsley, it seems she's already made escape plans with Quilty. Thus, she acts more romantic to lower Humbert's paranoia. It's notable that at the only point in their relationship where she has absolutely no dependence on him, at the end when she's married, Dolores absolutely refuses all of Humbert's advances. It's not that, as Trilling says, she doesn't recognize his feelings. In fact, she immediately thinks he's come to take her to some sleazy motel. She just finally has the power to say no. This is just my interpretation of events. And while it's objectively correct, and closer to what I believe Nabokov had intended, it's not the only way to view things. On a more cursory read, it's very easy indeed to view many of their interactions as mutually consensual. Carry me upstairs, please. I feel sort of romantic tonight. Dolores also isn't a virgin and is bisexual. Or if you're not willing to make that leap, has gay sex. And while that shouldn't matter at all, in a culture that so values chastity in young girls and conformity to the heterosexual ideal, that will impact how people view her. That's why Humbert literally brings it up to make his crimes look less severe. Sensitive gentlewomen of the jury, I was not even her first lover. But what ultimately makes me unable to agree this is a love story, even a one-sided one, is who the hell is Dolores Hayes? In 300 pages of obsessing over her, we barely get to know anything about her as a person. We hear about every curve of her body, but as far as her personality, all we can really say is that her mother thinks she's a brat, her school psychologist thinks she's underdeveloped, she likes movies, and she's good at tennis, but treats matches more like fun than competition. That's nothing! And all this limited knowledge either comes from other people telling Humbert about her, or are chunks Humbert briefly mentions in between discussing how hot she is. Their conversations, while frequent, don't amount to much more than small talk, with Lowe more interested in hanging out with her friends, and Humbert more interested in getting off. I'll admit, I'm not exactly a love guru, but this seems a lot more like just sexual obsession. Okay, with all that out of the way, we can finally talk about the movie. Right from the start, we have a pretty major deviation. Where the novel opened with a psychologist's note, and the knowledge that Humbert is writing this in prison, the film begins with Humbert entering Quilty's house to kill him. Well, actually, it starts with two minutes of Humbert painting Lowe's toenails over the credits. But after that, it's the death scene. Kubrick wanted to start with Quilty's death as a hook because he thought the plot is dragged down around the midpoint when going chronologically. This isn't necessarily a bad idea, and we get a very interesting opening with it. Peter Sellers, a comedy actor and all-around horrible human being, is cast in the role of Quilty, and honestly does a pretty impressive job at conveying the character's eccentricity. Roman Pink? You're supposed to say Roman Palm. The problem with opening right on Quilty's death is that you've skipped over a lot of the stuff you need to establish. And much of this will never be established, as the movie jumps immediately to Ramsdale. Keep in mind, 
we've gotten no information on Humbert's youth. The period which he lists as the reason for his sexual proclivities. No information on his history of stays at mental institutions. And next to no indication that this entire story is just Humbert's account of events written in his prison cell. In the novel, the entire thing is written in the past tense, with frequent interjections appealing to the audience or giving further context. It creates a degree of separation for the audience to be able to recognize that perhaps this is not exactly how events played out. And the film gives some indication that this is merely Humbert's account, but these are few and far between. There's only one point in the film where he talks directly to the audience. But what do you know, folks? I just couldn't make myself do it. But by far the most persistent deviation from the original book is that in the movie, there is no Dolores Hayes. Well, yes, obviously Dolores Hayes is still a character, but she's not called Dolores. She's almost always called Lolita by everybody. Who is this? Lolita. Lolita. No. Lolita. Lolita, that's right. Now, this may seem like an inconsequential difference, but it's not. In the novel, there are 239 instances of the word Lolita. 234 of these are Humbert's internal monologue. Only five of them are someone calling Dolores Lolita, and all five of these are Humbert. From the very first chapter, we are told that in my arms, she was always Lolita. Lolita is not a person. It's the pet name for Humbert's sexual obsession. It is directly linked to their relationship. So to take that name and just make it what everyone calls her, you're simultaneously stripping Dolores of some of what little agency she's afforded, as well as reducing the impact of Humbert's obsession. I can forgive a lot of the changes, as struggles of adapting to a new medium, but this was a choice, and it's an awful one. Although, to be consistent with the movie, I will be using Lolita for this section. Alright, back to the plot. So we're straight into Ramsdale, with Humbert telling us he's got a job lined up at Beardsley College in the fall. Charlotte is showing Humbert around the house, and it's pretty clear that this adaptation will be leaning heavily into the comedic. And uh, we're very progressive, intellectually. That is immediately apparent. The novel can be a pretty funny read at times too, so that's not exactly a deal breaker, but it's something to watch out for. Charlotte takes Humbert out to the garden, where we see Lolita. She's portrayed by Sue Lyon, who was 14 during casting and filming, and stylized to look a bit older. Humbert agrees to stay at the Hayes house. What was the decisive factor? Uh, my garden? Cherry pies. Oh. <laughs> we see him leering at Lolita, and then we're taken to a dance. This is a new scene for the movie, where we get some of Humbert's opposition to Lolita interacting with boys her own age, and get introduced to the neighbors, whose role in this story is increased so that Kubrick can make a joke about being Sweeners. In fact, John and I were both broad minded. And at the dance, who else is there but Claire Quilty? Yeah, you know how I said I don't mind the change to start with Quilty's death? One of the main benefits I see to it is that by starting with Quilty, you give the entire audience that second read experience, where they're vigilant for any indication of Claire Quilty. For instance, audiences probably wouldn't take note of this poster in Lolita's room if they didn't know that Quilty was going to be important. I can see this potentially making the mystery elements more interesting for the average viewer. But Kubrick got Peter Sellers for the role, and Kubrick really fucking loves Peter Sellers apparently, so Quilty's role is massively inflated. He's given plenty of time to riff, and his status as a mysterious omnipotent figure in the novel is exchanged for C-tier sex jokes. Did I do that? Did I? <laughs> and wow. afterwards, uh, you know, I showed you my garden. This is what we got instead of Humbert's backstory, by the way. Kubrick also turns all of Charlotte's negative traits way up. While in the novel, she was still characterized as at her wit's end raising low, ready to send her off to boarding school. The film portrays her as even more domineering. 
And lastly, I forbid you to disturb Professor Humbert again. He is a writer and he is not to be disturbed. Sieg Heil. She's always ditzy, hysterical, and yelling, contrasted with Humbert and Lolita's relative calm. It isn't my fault if I feel young. Why should my child resent it? You don't resent it, do you? Do you think that I'm just a, a foolish romantic American girl? No, 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 no. The film is also much crueler to Charlotte. When talking to Quilty, a man she clearly thinks very highly of and is implied to have slept with, he doesn't remember her. When Humbert reads her letter confessing her love for him, he's laughing the entire time. That you want me as much as I do you, as a lifelong mate. <laughs> and after they're married, she becomes erratic and threatens to kill herself. But if I ever found out that you didn't believe in God, I think I would commit suicide. Hey, a gun. Humbert didn't like Charlotte in the novel, but even he didn't write her with this much contempt. It's to the point that when she finds Humbert's journal and he tells her, It's a hallucination, you're, you're crazy, Charlotte. It's almost believable, especially when she seems to blame the entire affair on Lolita. You were the soul of integrity. How did we produce such a little beast? Eventually, she's killed, and we're reminded that this film is set in the 50s. She was always so gay, wasn't she, John? Yeah, just... But for some reason, Kubrick decided to give Charlotte some medical disorder, which would have killed her soon anyways. She hadn't long to live anyhow. She only had one kidney. Uh, yes, born that way. that's right. And the one kidney she had was distressed. Uh, she had uh, uh, nephritis. Nephritis. I really hope that was some Hayes Code thing, because it doesn't make any sense otherwise. So Humbert picks Lolita up from camp, and soon they're at the hotel, but not before another session of the Claire Quilty Comedy Hour. This time, we're treated to two minutes of pointless improv, culminating in, you guessed it, a middling sex joke. What do you do with your excess energy? Well, we do a lot of things with my excess energy. <laughs> If you're wondering what we lost to secure time for this impeccable humor, the movie has cut everything to do with sleeping pills. Y'all remember Humbert's big plan to drug low and how he tests pills on Charlotte? Not here. Another important thing we don't get is a definition of what a nymphette is. I'm serious. Humbert says nymphette in one sentence of the movie. What drives me insane is the twofold nature of this nymphette. But we never learn what that means. I'm not asking for the pages and pages of nymphatology on offer in the novel, but an actual inkling of the main character's paraphilia in a story centered around that paraphilia is kind of important. And we don't get that, because Kubrick would rather have Peter Sellers talk about fucking judo. Once they get to the room and realize there's only the one bed, we get another example of the Hays Code in action. Uh, two people sharing one room inevitably enter into a kind of, um, how shall I say, um, kind of. Um... Aren't you going to go down to see about the cut? In the novel, Lowe responds to that with, it's called incest. So, the code will let you imply a sexual relationship between a stepdad and his underage daughter is happening, but not let you draw any attention to that being a bad thing really upholding those high moral values. Humbert's interaction with Quilty at the hotel ensues. The brief interaction of the novel is stretched to four and a half minutes, because Kubrick simply could not bear to cut a single frame of Peter Sellers' performance. It's great to see a normal face, because I'm a normal guy. It'd be great for two normal guys like us to get together and talk about world events, you know, in a normal sort of way. Okay, not gonna lie, I, I like that bit. But it gets old quick. We don't get the same sense of Humbert's paranoia in the situation either, even with the movie literally putting a police convention in the hotel. We then get another scene where Humbert and the hotel worker set up a cot, in another example of the comedy scenes in this movie dragging on way too long. And then we get the scene. The scene where Humbert first assaults Dolores. So how did they opt to depict it? 
not very well. Lolita tells Humbert she played a game at camp, whispers in his ears, his eyes bug out, and she says, You mean you never played that game when you were a kid? Then we cut to them on the road. There's no signs of Lolita being in physical pain. The line where she calls him a rapist is gone. Instead, we're treated to a few minutes of small talk until Lolita eventually asks to call her mother. When she first hears of her mother's death, she thinks it's a joke. Your mother is dead. <laughs> Come on now, cut it out. Why can't I call her? Your mother is dead. This is one of the changes from the book I actually like. I've had this exact same reaction to hearing about loved ones dying in the past. It emphasizes the childish naivete, where death doesn't seem like a real possibility. But this rare dialogue change I like is immediately followed by one of the worst in the whole movie. We cut to the next hotel, where Lolita is crying. Humbert tries to console her by telling her he'll buy her a new record player, and she says, I promise you'll never leave me. I don't want to ever be in one of those horrible places for juvenile delinquents. <laughs> Whatever makes you think that that would happen to you. I know it would. And anyway, I'd rather be with you. You're a lot better than one of those places. In the novel, the concept of juvenile detention facilities is brought up by Humbert because he is threatening Lo. He says if she tells anyone about what he's doing to her, she will wind up in a horrible detention facility. He belabors the point until she's too terrified to tell anyone, making her feel like she has equal or greater guilt in the whole affair. It's blatant abuser tactics, and changing it so that she's scared she'll not be with Humbert instead of scared because he's feeding her threats of jail is gross. We then skip the entire road trip, which if you're trying to cut for time is probably the easiest part to skip. The major beats of the road trip, Humbert's growing paranoia over Lowe's interactions with boys, and Lowe's growing discontent over being stuck with him, are covered decently well in a conversation where Lolita asks to participate in the school play, and Humbert, worried about the boys who will be in it, refuses. The scene where Humbert is called into Lowe's school about her development is changed for yet another entry of the Claire Quilty Comedy Hour. This time, Peter Sellers has broken into the house and is cosplaying as Sigmund Freud to convince Humbert to let her do the play. And since this is the final edition of the Claire Quilty Comedy Hour, let's talk about his role in this movie. Now, in the novel, it was believable that Humbert wouldn't take notice of Quilty. While he is present throughout the story, most mentions of him are just passing references, such as Lowe saying, hey, that guy looks like queer Quilty, or Humbert remarking that a cigarette ad has a famous playwright on it. Even in their one direct interaction at the hotel, Humbert doesn't really see the man he's talking to. In the movie, because Kubrick just finds Peter Sellers hilarious, we get a ton of him. And because of this, it just looks like Humbert's an idiot for not recognizing that it's always the same dude. And these comedy hours drag on. I wasn't joking when I said we got this instead of Humbert's backstory, because about 15 minutes of this movie is dedicated to brand new quilty moments, most of it at a pretty low level of actual comedy. She is a lovely girl, you know, it's a swing, you know, it's a jazz, and she has got the curvatures which I didn't take a lot of notice of. Anyways, Humbert agrees to let Lolita act, if only to get Peter Sellers to stop improv -ing. This time, the play actually happens, and at the end of it, Humbert learns that Lolita has been skipping her piano lessons, although the element of her saving up money to escape has been removed. Humbert drags her back to the house, where their big fight happens, and we're treated to the best scene in the movie. I don't think this is a good movie, but that is almost all on the script and direction. The two leads are actually pretty good when they're allowed to be. We see the culmination of Humbert's fears over boys. Don't tell me anymore because I know exactly what you've been doing. You've been with this boy, this leading man of yours, this Roy. Isn't that so? You're sick. Oh, stop. Don't throw those silly, silly cliches no, at seriously. me. Don't tell me anymore. You've you been with this boy, haven't you? Come on, tell me. You need help. You're imagining things. Shut up, Lolita. Stop that silly talk. As well as his absolute desperation to control her, 
But I believe you. It's partly my fault, I realize. That is something that's happened on account of this horrible place. All these people poking their nose into our business, and I never see you anymore. What with your soda fountains and your extra... Stop doing that! I love Sue Lyon's body language in these scenes. You can feel her terror. This time, Humbert suggests that they leave Beardsley instead of Lolita. She still escapes, with him finding her on the telephone. She agrees to leave with him, and we get the rare hint of a sexual relationship Kubrick was willing to include. Notably, it's the only one, besides the first, that can be interpreted as even remotely consensual from Lolita's standpoint. It's so hard. I can't serve a man. So the two return to the road, where Humbert freaks out about a car following them, and Lolita winds up in the hospital for a cold. After visiting her in the hospital, he gets a call from... Um, uh, who is this, please? Uh, uh, I'm sort of really sorry to uh, uh, disturb you. I hope I really haven't woken you at this terribly late hour. Claire fucking Quilty. And, of course, he doesn't recognize him. Quilty asks about his relationship with his daughter, giving him the same paranoia that he was supposed to have gotten from the hotel scene about an hour late. Humbert returns to the hospital to find Lolita is gone, and after getting into a fight with the hospital staff, resigns himself. We then see the letter getting written, and Humbert shows up on her doorstep. She begins the reunion by apologizing to him. I wrote to you about a week ago. I was beginning to think maybe you were sore or something. I must say, I wouldn't blame you if you were. It's a fine thing, me dropping out of sight for so long and then writing you for a handout. Not in the book. And now that she's aged up, the camera is much less interested in her body than it's been throughout the rest of the movie. After pressing her, Humbert gets her to reveal who had taken her from him. It was Claire Quilty. We also get another line I quite like. I don't suppose it ever occurred to you that when you moved into our house, my whole world didn't revolve around you. She tells him why she left Quilty, albeit an innuendo to please the code. But it never turned out that way, and instead he wanted me to cooperate with the others, making some kind of a, you know, an art movie. Humbert then makes his plea for her to leave with him, telling her she has no obligation to her husband. She replies, I bring too many things in my life, I can't do that to him, he needs me. Another original line for this scene, that, like her initial apology, sees her shifting most of the blame for the whole situation onto herself. And after she refuses to go with him, and he gives her the money, we get another. I'm really sorry that I cheated so much. But I guess that's just the way things are. It really seems like this whole scene was constructed to make you think Lolita was the bad guy in the situation. Humbert then leaves the house in tears, and we return to the beginning, with him entering Quilty's house to exact revenge. An epilogue tells us Humbert died while awaiting trial, but we still get no mention of Humbert's mental status, or that the entire story is his narrative. On the positive side, though, we also get no mention of Lolita dying in childbirth, so you can choose to believe that she lives, and gets to enjoy a happy life with Dick, and hopefully some therapy. So that was Stanley Kubrick's Lolita, and I hope you can see why it misses the mark. Kubrick would say he couldn't make the film he wanted to because of the censors. But there were other films at the time that could hint at topics like abuse within the bounds of the code. And if he truly just couldn't have made a movie that acknowledges the reality of the story with the censors, then he always could have just not made the movie. Nobody was forcing him. And beyond the sanitization, he made decision after decision which changed the story for the worse calling her Lolita the whole time, not giving us any backstory on Humber, not even the knowledge that he's well aware he's a pedophile, scaling back on the idea that the entire story is being told from Humbert's point of view to the point it seems more like just a quirky way to deliver exposition instead of a calculated framing presented by the criminal, making Charlotte seem like a hysterical freak, removing references to Humbert's most vile behavior, portraying Lowe as more consenting and more to blame for the whole situation, and subjecting us to far more of the Claire Quilty comedy hour than we ever needed. It hits many of the same points, but this is a different story. 
This is not to say that a film needs to perfectly adhere to the source material to be a good adaptation. One film that I think demonstrates this very well is the 2022 version of All Quiet on the Western Front. The film deviates pretty heavily from the original book, changing the story's structure, omitting many plot points, and creating just as many unique ones. It deviates from its source material just as much, if not more, than the Kubrick film. But despite these changes, the overarching anti-war theme of the story is maintained. This is not the case with Kubrick's Lolita, because he didn't want it to be. The people behind All Quiet on the Western Front had a deep understanding of what their source novel meant. Kubrick didn't. He seemed to think he was reading a love story, and he made that movie. Let's step into the shoes of a hypothetical Kubrick stan. They might say, well, of course Dolores would seem more in love with Humbert. Of course the wife will seem even more crazy. The film is told from Humbert's perspective. Just because he didn't bane that into you every 10 seconds doesn't mean it can't be true. But I just can't buy it. The movie seems to treat the whole Humbert narrator thing like a contractual obligation they had to meet a five-line quota on rather than the essential framing device of the story. And even so, the book is also from Humbert's perspective. And while both mediums leave you with an unreliable narrator, the book gives you far more of an inkling as to what's going on. Lolita is, in a sense, a mystery story, where you, the reader, try to piece together the whole truth of what is happening behind Humbert's attempts to paint himself in the best possible light. All the while, you still have direct confirmation from the psychiatrist and Humbert himself that he is a monster. If the novel is a great mystery, where you piece together the full narrative from the bits and pieces Humbert gives you, the Kubrick film is BBC's Sherlock, where nothing is given to you, and you don't even have Sherlock to tell you, here's what really happened. And also, I want to kiss Liam Moriarty really hard on the lips. I oh, don't know, I didn't actually watch Sherlock, I just go on AO3. There are definitely elements of the film that work, or at the very least, I could see working. Like I said, the actors do a decent job, even if the characters they've been given have been changed. And while I don't agree with Kubrick's take on the book, he is objectively correct about Ohio. It's, it's in Ohio, you, you like it there. I'll hate it, I know I will. But the thing about the Kubrick adaptation is that when you completely overhaul the story, it's at least very interesting to watch the train wreck happen. I don't know if I can say the same for our second film. Part 3 Leaning more into the foot fetish was certainly a choice. 35 years after the Kubrick film, Adrian Lyne, who had previously directed several erotic dramas and also Flashdance, decided he would be the next to take a stab at adapting Lolita. Nabokov had been dead for 20 years at this point, and given his experience on the Kubrick film, he almost certainly wouldn't have been willing to write the screenplay. So, Lyne commissioned screenplays from a host of famous screenwriters, but wound up rejecting most of them before finally landing on a screenplay from Stephen Schiff, a writer for The New Yorker. Now, the writing process for this one was quite different from Kubrick. In fact, they looked at the Kubrick film as an example of how not to adapt Lolita, a sentiment I absolutely agree with. They wanted to be more faithful to the original novel, especially when it came to toning down the role of Quilty. So if my main issue with the Kubrick film was how it completely rewrote the book and missed the point, I must love this movie, right? Well, not quite. You see, while the film may come closer to depicting the novel, I still think it does come up short in a lot of ways. For starters, while Adrian Lyon may have wanted to be more faithful to the book, like Kubrick, he still considers it a love story. The Lyon film continues the tradition of starting at the end, as we get a long shot of Humbert driving down a long winding road. He's covered in blood, his driving is erratic, and a revolver is sliding around on the seat. We then get an abbreviated version of the opening monologue. In my arms, she was always Lolita. Before, holy shit, we actually get a flashback to his childhood. But while it has the flashback, the film barely goes into anything about Humbert's past. 
All we get is his relationship with Annabelle, and it's changed significantly from the book. Both of them are aged up to 14, and their relationship is made to seem real Hollywood movie type, with long, drifting shots of grazing knees, sultry glances, as opposed to the book's relationship, which portrays them as getting caught and generally just fumbling around. But just like the book, Annabelle is soon dead, and we get a paraphrased line from the book explaining the effect this has on Humbert's sexuality. The poison was in the wound, you see, and the wound wouldn't heal. And this is part of a trend throughout the movie. Now, the line film is going to be a lot more faithful to the book as far as showing what's actually happening, but there's still a big degree of sanitization, such as aging people up. That poison in the wound line is nice, but it's a little bit indirect and poetic on its own. Whereas in the novel, it's followed up by the much more blatant line, I found myself maturing amid a civilization which allows a man of 25 to court a girl of 16, but not a girl of 12. Anyways, cut to Humbert, heading to Ramsdale. He's got a job lined up at Beardsley, just like in the Kubrick adaptation. And we don't get any more info on his past, such as his wife or his mental problems. We get to the Hayes household. Charlotte shows him around the place, and eventually we're led out to the garden, where we see Lo. We open on a shot that shows her soaking wet body with her face obscured behind a plant. She's reading a magazine under a sprinkler, for some reason. And the camera work is essentially just going to be Humbert's POV. There's a lot of leering shots lingering on her body. Line really leans into Humbert's fondness for her feet. Lo doesn't put on shoes until she leaves for camp in this movie. And it's not fun to watch. Even with Lo once again aged up from the novel's 12, it's still uncomfortable to watch a kid through the eyes of a predator. And this is almost certainly a goal of the film, to discomfort much like the book. But the problem with converting to a visual medium is that now you're doing close-up perv shots of a real child's ass. It's not necessarily a change from the way Humbert is definitely looking at her in the book, it's just harder to stomach when you have to do the looking. What is changed from the book is the behavior of Lo. Line makes the bare minimum choice to let Dolores keep her name, but notably increases her role in the relationship. She's given even less of a personality outside of flirting with Humbert, and she's made the initiator of literally everything. Whereas in the book, Humbert goes out of his way to find excuses to touch her, not to mention the lap scene. Here, he's portrayed as almost the passive, frightened victim of a child just trying to jump his bones. The film lifts plenty of quotes from the novel, but it's clearly coming at the source material with the cultural character of the Lolita archetype in mind. Lo eventually heads off to camp, and Lois finds Humbert in Lo's room to give him the letter. I'm leaving, but I'll be back later. What the hell are you doing in there? Humbert doesn't laugh while he's reading it this time, and we get an instant cut to them being married. The sleeping pills make an appearance, but their use is changed. Humbert isn't testing them out on Charlotte, so he can eventually use them on Lo. His goal is just to avoid having to sleep with Charlotte. The choice to include the pills, but not the context of drugging Lo, makes it clear that this movie is stripping Humbert of all his agency. The Humbert of the novel is a man who crafts a plan to marry into access to a kid, drug this kid, and then assault them, all the while regularly fondling her. He's an active character. While Humbert claims that Lo does engage in some playful flirting, it's absolutely not the story of a child seducing a helpless older man that lines presenting it as here. Anyways, Charlotte dies at about 37 minutes into the movie. Another change Line wanted to make was devoting more time to the road trip, whereas Kubrick took more than half of his film to even get to that part. Humbert goes and gets low from camp, and as they're driving off, she takes her clothes off in the back seat to change another sexualized scene that's not in the book. They get to the hotel, 
and as Humber is booking the room, Lo approaches a dog, owned by none other than Claire Quilty. This is one of the only Quilty scenes that's wholly original to the movie. So they accomplish their goal of reducing his role compared to the Kubrick film, but he's still overstated compared to the novel. The actual scene in the movie is basically just Quilty calling Lo pretty. He can smell when people are sweet. He likes sweet people. Nice young people. Like you. It does carry some worrying implications for the rest of the film, because if everything is supposed to be from Humbert's perspective, framed as him telling the story, does this scene, absent of Humbert, imply that that's not the case? That we're getting an objective view of the situation, unimpeded by Humbert's perspective. Because if so, that's not great. It's probable the people making this film just weren't thinking that hard, but you know, this is the kind of story you really should be triple checking your draft on. So Humbert and Lowe get up to the room. With the abolition of the Hayes Code, we can finally get the line. Two people sharing the same hotel room are bound to enter into a, uh, into a, well, how can I put it, into a, into a kind of, um... The word is incest. But she's smiling and laughing, and it's being played as a joke. Afterwards, they grab dinner, where Lowe points out Quilty. Don't you think that guy over there looks exactly like Quilty? Though, now that there's the scene of them talking beforehand, it's kind of weird she doesn't just ask him directly if he's Quilty. They go back to the room, so Lo can go to bed, and Humbert can sensually remove her sock. Humbert has the run-in with Quilty. It's interspersed with footage of a bug zapper, to heighten the tension, I guess. He goes back to the room and goes to sleep. Then, morning comes, and we don't get the she seduced me line, but it's unnecessary. Because like at every other point in this movie, Lo is shown as the sole initiator of everything. The next morning, Lo is visibly in pain, and upset when pressed about her sexual history, but overall still jovial. We get the line, Well, what'd you expect? I was a daisy fresh girl and look what you've done to me. I should call the police and tell them that you raped me, you dirty old man. But she's smiling and laughing, and it's being played like a joke. This happens pretty much any time that Lo acknowledges how messed up the situation is, framing her as fully consensual and just screwing with Humbert a bit. Her good mood continues until she learns of her mother's death. But after crying for a bit, she's basically over it. We get one more crying scene, but Line is more focused on delivering a bunch of road trip scenes, largely written for the movie and all seemingly with the intent of providing sexually loaded situations. Humbert shoving his hand in Lowe's mouth for a jawbreaker, Lowe slapping her feet in his face, Humbert undressing her, a very uncomfortable sex scene where Lowe is reading comic strips, which I get it, I also get off to Jughead. At one point, they go to a hotel, and the bed has something called a magic fingers, I had never heard of this, but evidently it's this thing that would vibrate a bed by just shaking it really hard. It was invented in 1958, so it's period inappropriate for the 1947 setting. And it's only there so Humbert can deliver this line. My magic fingers aren't enough. And so that the camera can slowly pan over a vibrating Lowe. Soon, the two are at Beardsley, and Lowe is trying to get permission to do the play. Humbert denies. But then Lo places her bare foot upon his lower region. She teases at his extremities until he agrees to raise her allowance and let her be in the play. Now, this is a bit of a diversion from the novel. Firstly, the prominence of her feet is something I'm really starting to think is Adrian Lyne's fetish. There's definitely a bit of feet stuff in the book, but they've kicked it up to the max. More importantly, Lo is once again shown as the primary instigator. In the novel, Humbert creates the allowance for favors system, and Lowe is able to negotiate increases by withholding rather than rubbing his thighs until he relents. She's also not the one who convinces him to let her into the play. That's the school officials. He uses the situation to coax favors out of her, but that's besides the point. It's not enough for Humbert not to instigate anything. Not even outside forces can come into play. In this telling, everything is Lowe's doing. It leans heavily into the idea of a Lolita seductress, 
as well as many of Humbert's thoughts on nymphettes. But it's not an accurate depiction of Dolores, the actual character from the novel. She certainly had some agency in the novel, but it's absurd to me how much line just seems to pile everything onto her shoulders. Anyways, she joins the play where we see Quilty puffing away at smoke. And for the scene establishing Lowe is stockpiling money to escape, Line makes the interesting choice to have them fighting naked in a bed over a pile of coins. Following this, we get the scene where they fight and Lowe runs off. They do a neat thing here and give Lowe a milk mustache, which annoys Humbert. This parallels a scene back in Ramsdale, where Lowe had a milk mustache and he was into it, demonstrating how Humbert, despite his sexual attraction to Lowe, has almost grown to hate her as an actual person. Humbert slaps Lo, and she runs off. Of course, when you don't portray him as the initiator of anything, this seems way more out of left field, instead of the natural escalation of an abusive relationship. But eventually, they're on the road again. Line has finally decided to consistently depict Humbert as abusive, so we get more physical violence, and even see Lo unsuccessfully try to drive the car away when they get a flat tire. I think the line characterization of Dolores does improve towards the end here, cause once the movie has seemingly gotten over showing off her body and depicting her as almost a succubus character, they must have actually read the book and realized, oh, she's like trying to escape in this whole sequence. She's also clearly shown to be collaborating with Quilty, talking to him at a gas station and presumably sneaking out to meet him. Okay, so at this point in the story, you have in Humbert, a character driven to the extremes of paranoia, for fear that his crimes will catch up with him. How do you show that? Well, if you're Adrian Lyne, you make the camera go wobbly and have him get spooked by a bunch of people in silly masks. After that bizarre decision, Lo gets checked into the hospital. Humbert realizes she escaped. He gets just crazy violent with the hospital staff. I mean, he repeatedly bashes a doctor's head on the ground. I don't know why they just let him go after that. The 1940s were crazy. Cut to three years later, he gets the letter from Lo. We get a scene of him practicing with the revolver. Then he heads over to her. Lo opens the door. And I always think it's just so funny how they try to age Lo up in these things. You know, you can't really do aging makeup for a character going from 14 to 17. So they just gotta change her hairstyle, give her glasses, and put her in less revealing clothes. To the dismay of many, we also do not get a long leering shot of her feet. The scene with her is pretty much just an abbreviated version of the novel one. The only notable changes are that Dick never comes into the house to say hi, we just see him in the backyard, and that when Humber is leaving, he asks her for forgiveness. Lo, can you ever forget what I've done to you? Say goodbye, Molly. Say goodbye to my dad. I love her response. Very polite way of saying, screw you. Though, in the book, he's not asking for forgiveness. Rather, that she reconsider his offer for her to come with him. Also, during the scene, she drinks a glass of milk without getting a mustache, which I think is supposed to be the conclusion of the milk motif, but it's shot weird where she goes straight from grabbing the glass to having an almost finished cup of milk. So maybe the milk motif wasn't an actual thing, and I just got overly excited at the prospect that Adrian Lyne might have done something interesting with the movie. Anyways, he heads to his car and has a hallucination where he sees Lo as her younger self, which is weird and would probably work better if it wasn't just a costume change. He heads to Quilty, interspersed with shots of him fleeing the cops after killing them. This movie's Quilty isn't nearly as fun to watch. And the fact that they didn't give him pants means we're on full meat alert during the frankly quite brutal killing scene. We cut back to Humbert as he flees onto a hill and looks down upon a town. 
What I heard then was the melody of children at play, nothing but that. And I knew that the hopelessly poignant thing was not Lolita's absence from my side, but the absence of her voice from that chorus. We get a final shot of Lo, and a card telling us how Humbert died, and... Oh, come on! The only person who would know her as Lolita is dead at that point. Just call her Dolores. But anyways, that's the Adrian Lyne version of Lolita. Near the end, it seems to lean very heavily into the idea of Humbert searching for redemption. What with him asking directly for forgiveness, and the final line being, it's actually okay for me to not have her. I just want her to be a happy kid. Are these ideas present in the novel? Somewhat but their extent is greatly increased here. Between the redemption push and Humbert barely being an active abuser with negative intentions, it reads like they're trying to stay more faithful to the novel plot-wise, but still falling into the trap of making Humbert a far more sanitized protagonist. Worse than Humbert's portrayal, however, is Dolores's. I don't mean to be prudish, but frankly, it's just completely irresponsible the way the movie treats her character. She's made to be 100% the seductress, the succubus, the nymphette of Humbert's imagination. Seemingly all advances are made by her. Line clearly sees her as the one in control for much of the story. And meanwhile, the movie is filling itself with shot after shot of her butt, her legs, her feet, in a way that's clearly trying to make it seem like this is just so hot and so romantic. During the road trip, the film gets really obsessed with her eating bananas, and they teach this in the subtle filmmaking school. Do you know what a banana kinda looks like? <laughs> Once again, we have Lolita told by a person who fundamentally misunderstands the novel. No matter how closely they follow the plot of the novel, they're handicapped by their view of it as a love story, and they seemingly have no interest in the possibility of an unreliable narrator which is the central conceit of the fucking book. Part 4. Can they ever make a movie of Lolita? So, we've looked at two very different attempts to adapt Lolita into film. But I think it's clear that neither of these movies comes even close to capturing the essence of the original novel. So we're left to wonder, can Lolita even work as a film in the first place? Probably the most obvious issue with adapting the book is the material of the book, and we'll talk about the subject matter in a bit, but another issue you'll notice watching the movies is that they just don't sound nearly as good. One of the greatest strengths of the book is its prose, which is hard to translate across mediums. The line film directly quotes the novel constantly, but it winds up coming off as more awkward than interesting. If you wanted to do it justice, you'd need a really good screenwriter. Beyond the prose, even the structure of the novel is just not one that makes for an easy adaptation. Adrian Lyne noted how it doesn't really fit into a traditional three-act structure, but I think the more difficult element is that the entire story is written by a character who we know is a liar, who consistently aims to portray himself in the highest light, and even without the element of deception, it's still being written years after the fact, while Humbert is dealing with his steadily deteriorating health. This novel is not a fully accurate depiction of events, and a good reader will recognize that. But this element is a bit harder to translate to film, where you're seeing the events from an ostensibly neutral standpoint as they play out. By taking us out of Humbert's head, but simultaneously not showing us any other side of the story, we're much less able to recognize this as a one-sided account. I wish either of the films would have kept the framing device of this being a manuscript written from jail, and being analyzed by psychiatrists. You could cut back to Humbert working on it in occasion, and have more narration to make it clear this is his story. Nabokov's second screenplay does something sort of like this, making the psychologist the narrator. Another idea that I heard on the previously mentioned Lolita podcast is to have Humbert basically serve as the director of the story, giving him command over the lights, the cameras, so you can have him say, okay, zoom in on this, or whatever, 
and make it clear he's controlling the presentation of the narrative. This seems like it'd be pretty dorky and handholdy over the course of a full movie, but it should be made very obvious that Humbert's in control of the narrative, because that's the whole point of the story. Besides the structure, the book obviously has insanely difficult topics to put in a movie. This is a novel about the sexual abuse of a child by her stepfather. Murder, drugging, the kind of stuff you'd really struggle pitching to a studio. Films may no longer have to adhere to the rules of the Hays Code, but that doesn't mean there's absolute creative freedom either. To make a mainstream film, you need money and companies willing to work with you. The Adrian Lyne film found itself struggling to find a distribution partner for the North American release, because no company wanted to attach its brand to that topic. If you choose to adapt Lolita, you're going to have no trouble finding actors. From what I've learned of the previous films, a lot of actors really want to play just a monstrous dude, and a lot of child star's parents really want their kids to be that dude's victim. But not a lot of people want to stake their own money on such a project. It's not a coincidence that both of the previous films were made by directors that had already built up quite a bit of goodwill. I'm not saying it's impossible to make a film with all the explicit contents of the novel. You'd probably have an easier time now than ever, but pedophilia remains probably the most taboo subject to depict on screen. This is likely the driving force behind the decision of both films to age Dolores up to about 14. And while this almost certainly helped in getting the film's funding and getting them past the censors, it is a severe departure from the source material where, by the time Lowe is 14, Humbert has started to talk about his aged nymphette. It's no coincidence that neither of the films seems interested in defining the term nymphette, because that would mean grappling with the fact that Humbert isn't a suave romantic, or a bumbling victim of circumstances, but a straight-up pedophile. But perhaps having a child actor, no matter what age, playing the role of Dolores Hayes is a bad idea. Being cast as Lolita was the worst thing that could have happened to Sue Lyon. That's not speculation on my part. Decades afterwards, Lyon would say, My destruction as a person dates from that movie. I defy any pretty girl who is rocketed to stardom at 14 in a sex nymphette role to stay on the level path thereafter. While filming, Lyon got the typical experience of being a woman working with Stanley Kubrick. She was reportedly treated badly and ignored on set. From what I can tell, it wasn't quite to the extent of his abuse of Shelley Duvall in The Shining, but Lyon was still just 14. And meanwhile, the film's producer, James B. Harris, was sleeping with her. Yeah. Yeah. She basically got the IRL Humbert experience. And all the while, Harris and Kubrick owned her contract for the next several years, which has just got to be terrifying. She wasn't getting any sympathy from the press either. Countless articles were published on her sexuality, as a child. After her brother's death, she was asked if he had killed himself because she played Lolita. Even her relationship with James B. Harris, while the details weren't known, was portrayed as her seducing older men, saying that she had caught the Lolita virus. Following the release of the film, seemingly everyone involved went on to continued or greater success, except Sue Lyon, whose acting career eventually petered out as she struggled with personal controversy and never being allowed to move past her reputation as a sex nymphette. A similar thing happened with Dominique Swain, the actor who portrayed Lolita in the 1997 film. Fortunately for her, none of the on-set stuff seemed to be quite as bad as for Lyon. At the very least, none of the producers slept with her, but she was also subject to a lot of crap by the media, and following the film, failed to take off into the prominence that you would assume after such a prestigious role, being typecast for quite a while as sexy young girl. Once again, none of the other people involved in the film saw any real hit to their careers. Line stopped making movies for a while, but that's just because a few projects fell through, not because his career was sunk. Jeremy Irons was portraying Humbert, but nobody started typecasting him as a child sex abuser. The world was capable of realizing, oh, this is acting, and continued to give him big roles and awards. 
Not so for Dominique Swain. It seems like a pretty high ask of any child actor for them to sign up for the stress of portraying arguably the worst thing a child can experience, the constant media inquisitions into their personal and sexual identity. All for a role that is almost certainly career suicide. So, the actual act of making Lolita a movie is hard enough, but all the films we saw failed before filming even began, because the biggest obstacle to getting a proper adaptation may boil down to interpretation. We saw in the line film that even if you basically copy the novel beat for beat, detail for detail, that can't overcome missing the point of the novel. Poor interpretation is a serious obstacle, because like we covered at the start, this is perhaps the most misinterpreted story of all time. And because of these adaptations, the common conception of Lolita has strayed even further from the source material. When a lot of people think of Lolita, they're thinking of one of these films, both of which lean far more into the idea of a Lolita figure, ensnaring an older man into a relationship, and frame the relationship as far more consensual. In the minds of many, Humbert is not a child sex abuser, but rather a hapless victim of a ruthless little girl. So in any future adaptation, that's going to be more in line with what audiences expect. Of course, the interpretation of Lolita as a love story, and the Lolita figure as a cultural concept, does not originate from these movies. While the films certainly amplified these ideas, they have always been present. Let's not forget the Lionel Trilling piece cited by Kubrick. And Trilling was by no means alone. And this gets into another idea. What if we as a society don't want the actual story of the novel, but rather the flawed interpretation? I mean, clearly the idea of a sexually prolific young girl is popular. Both actresses who played Dolores Hayes were subject to constant media speculation on their sex lives. And this goes well beyond just Lolita. A girl who achieves any level of notoriety becomes an object of sexual desire, regardless of their age. Just in the past few years, we've seen people counting down the days till Billie Eilish's 18th birthday, cartoonists drawing their rape fantasies of an underage Greta Thunberg, and an entire fandom springing up around an Italian high schooler as people use her as an example of why they'd want to rape young boys in ancient Rome. This is not a fate reserved for the famous. Essentially, every woman can recall being catcalled at a depressingly young age. Pornographic sites put barely legal models front and center. Our society is obsessed with the sexual availability of young girls. The Lolita figure, then, offers something enticing to many. A child portrayed as not only sexually available, but as the initiator, the pursuer of older men. The corrupting force. With the Lolita figure, no advances can ever be abusive. After all, there's no such thing as statutory with the succubus. Of course, this figure is a product of writers, not reality. But that hasn't stopped its proliferation across other media since. Stories like Leon the Professional and Kodomo no Jikan see a young girl sexually slash romantically pursuing an adult man in a position of power over her. And these concepts have tangible harm. There's, of course, the continued obsession with the sexuality of young girls, but it also leads to more direct abuse. In her memoir, Being Lolita, NYU professor Allison Wood tells the story of her grooming by her high school English teacher. The teacher had given her a copy of Lolita to read, as he had interpreted it as a love story and saw it as an affirmation of why it's totally good and normal for him to groom his student. Obviously, I don't think child sex abuse would disappear if everyone started interpreting Lolita properly, but the perception of the story as romantic demonstrably contributes to a wider cultural narrative around the sexuality of young girls that leads to more abuse. If we wanted to have any chance of a Lolita movie working, the cultural attitude needs to shift. But there's one last obstacle in the way for making a Lolita film that fully embodies the themes of the book. And that obstacle is an economic one. In the 1999 film, American Beauty, we follow the midlife crisis of Lester Burnham. He works out, 
quits his job and estranges himself from his wife and daughter, all in pursuit of one goal, sleeping with his daughter's friend from school. Once again, we have a story about an adult man's sexual pursuit of a young girl. However, when he has the opportunity to go through with it, Lester backs down, and like 10 minutes later, he's killed by the closeted homosexual Nazi paraphernaliac whose advances he had earlier spurned. It's a weird movie. But like in Lolita the novel, we have a pretty clear moral ruling. The film understands that Lester's actions are wrong. The other characters understand his actions are wrong. And Lester understands his actions are wrong. When confronted with the reality of what he's about to do, he backs down and then dies. By the credits, this film is practically screaming, sexually pursuing this teenager is bad. And that's all well and good. But this is the film's poster. This is the trailer. And in the film, we do see the teenager get naked. Not just her, but Lester's underage daughter too. Despite what the movie may think about Lester's attraction to the teenager, they still chose to sell this film with her naked body. Our cultural obsession with the sexuality of teenage girls, in turn, generates an economic motivation to sell stories with that same sexuality. Think of the now iconic poster for Kubrick's Lolita. Sue Lyon, looking at the camera, wearing heart-shaped sunglasses that never appear in the film, sucking on a lollipop, and considering Kubrick's fondness for Sigmund Freud, I think I can venture a guess at what that may symbolize. This image, playing on the idea of a seductress nymphette, and framed in an intentionally sexual manner, is how they chose to sell the movie to the public. This gets even more blatant in the Adrian Lyne version, where the initial shot of Lowe soaking wet in a sheer dress was one of the posters. Even for the novel, Nabokov famously didn't want any pictures of a girl on the cover. But over the years and republications, we've gotten girls in repose, girls sucking lollipops, girls' legs, girls' lips, girls that look kinda goofy. The version I first read was a full black and white spread of a girl's legs. And this is one of the better ones. No matter what the contents or attitude of the story, the marketing department knows sex is the way to sell it. Ultimately, it just doesn't seem like a new movie adaptation of Lolita is a good idea. The book doesn't translate well. Its meaning is routinely misunderstood by the only people with the clout to get a film adaptation greenlit. And even if the film did get the point of the novel, it's anyone's guess if society at large would even care to see it. Most damning of all, I think, is the position you put a young actor in by introducing her to the world as a character who, even if portrayed properly, is still culturally considered a little sex demon. It just doesn't seem like it can be done. Honestly, it sucks that a novel about childhood sex abuse has been so mishandled through relatively little fault of its own. But that's just the thing. This is just a novel. One entry into a much wider media landscape of stories of abuse. One with outsized influence, absolutely, but just one. We don't need to make more Lolitas when we have so many new stories to tell. I like to think our collective understanding of child sex abuse has changed since 1955. And the stories we tell should change to reflect that. Though, if anyone wanted to make Nabokov's original seven-hour screenplay, I will offer my full critical support. Not because it's a good idea, It'd just be really funny. Only if you're going to cast Danny DeVito as Dolores Hayes, though. Thanks so much if you stuck around till the end. This is the biggest project I've ever done, and it means so much to me that people were able to enjoy it. Like, comment, and subscribe. I know it might be weird to send a Lolita video to your friends, but this video's subject matter isn't exactly algorithm friendly, so sharing is highly appreciated, maybe send it to your enemies. A huge thanks to my lovely patrons, whose names are scrolling by right now. And I passed 1,000 subscribers while making this, so a huge thanks to all of you. 
This is the first step in my plot to world domination. I hinted at my history with this novel throughout the vid, but I'd like to expand on it as the credits roll. So, I first tried to read Lolita when I was 14, because I was a weird kid and was always trying to read the controversial banned book type of novels. I didn't even get to Ramsdale on my first attempt. Honestly, that's for the best, because I definitely wasn't emotionally mature enough to process the novel then. Then, last summer, I was walking around and I saw a street sign called Lolita Street, and I thought, wow, that's a horrible name for a street. I'm gonna go read the book, because my mental reasoning is top notch. On the same walk, I saw a Garfield Street, so maybe one day I'll have to make a Garfield video. Maybe that one will be seven hours long too. Here's what I've been working on. Yep, it's pretty beautiful if I do say so myself.